Thank you for joining us today, and our study is going to be focused around a, another difficult question that has come in and is often asked, and that is, where does evil come from? And it's uh, an important question, and wonderfully, the Bible does have an answer. Many people ask, did God create evil? If God did create evil, why doesn't he stop evil? If God's all-powerful, why would he not create man in his own image to abstain from evil or not to be capable of evil? Why is there evil in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people? And the questions that revolve around this subject uh, go on ad nauseum. But today, uh, throughout all of human history, uh, there has been much debate on the subject of, of evil, and today that's what we're going to be focusing specifically on. And there are very common questions that oftentimes frame that debate throughout the ages. Questions like, what is the origin of evil? Where did evil begin? Was it created by God? How did it get here? Why does it exist in our world? If there is a God... Why did he allow evil? If there is a God, why does he not stop evil? And so as we begin our study today, let's go back to the very uh, beginning, the book of Genesis, and let's discover the original state of the patriarch and the matriarch, Adam and Eve, in the garden as God had created them. And let's begin there because it's a very important passage. As always, I challenge you, if you're a new student of our channel, uh, always have a Bible, always have a way of taking notes, and always have a highlighter as we go through some of the great and classic passages of the Bible so that they'll be easy to find in the days ahead. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And I'm reading down through verse 31, uh, reading today out of the New Living Translation. Then God said... Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. And in the 21st century, why don't you pause long enough to highlight that? He created them male and female. He created them and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Pause right there. Notice how many times, and depending upon the translation that you're reading out of, God not only created us in his image, he gave us a capacity to reign and to rule. God never created you to be dominated by something negative. He always intends for you to be a dominating power for good an influencer for righteousness and holiness and the precepts and principles of God. Fill the earth and govern it, the scripture said. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, all of the animals that scurry along the ground. And then God said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all of the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. Uh, this is an incredible passage, and I want you for sure to run your highlighter through that. Everything God made, he saw that it was very good. In 
And evening passed, morning came, marking the sixth day. Uh, Let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Scriptures and we deal uh, with this very difficult question, where does evil come from? I pray uh, that as I guide every listener through the perfection of the Bible, that you'll help me to communicate and make every truth abundantly clear. I pray for people all around the world who watch these studies. I pray for them specifically that evil will never have power over them, that their home, their family, their children, their grandchildren, their health, their possessions would never come under the evil impact of the wickedness that exists in our world. May they find a place of peace and security in the arms of Almighty God, because you're not an evil God, you're a good God, and everything you created was good. I pray especially for those who perhaps feel as if God could never love them, or God could never forgive them, or they are forever destined to the curse of evil, I pray that you'll help me to communicate to them that you love them. And there is no evil, there is no spell, there is no curse, there is no generational curse that can hold them if they come to you in faith. Jesus said that he desired that we would be free and free indeed, or free of all. And I pray that that would be the overwhelming point made today, not a focus on negativity and evil, but an understanding of evil and an understanding that you're a good God. And we ask that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, uh, amen. If you're taking notes, let's get right into it. Question number one, what is the origin of of evil. Now, no one in their right mind can deny that we live in a world that is filled with wickedness and evil. Uh, I don't uh, turn TVs on uh, too often uh, when I'm on the road. Uh, Judy and I sometimes will sit down when I'm home in the evening and watch something together, but uh, I rarely watch the news. But you cannot help, and even in my travel schedule, and constantly walking through airports and media and TVs everywhere, you constantly hear about wickedness and evil and murders and school shootings and, and on and on. Where I was just at, uh, I didn't have a TV on uh, the entire time I was there, but a local piece came up on my computer as I was working one day. And a woman not far from the Bible college where I currently serve as president was stabbed 56 times, 34-year-old mother. And they didn't know why and they didn't know who had committed the crime and it was just discovered her body had been in the apartment for a period of time. And it's horrible. And people have a genuine right in disgust to shake their fist and say, why does evil exist in our world? Well, if you're going to have an intelligent understanding of evil, the first question I believe that is fundamental that has to be answered is what is the origin of evil or where did it come from? Go into the New Testament into uh, the book of Luke and the 10th chapter because Jesus actually made a wonderful comment that gives us insight about the origin of evil. Luke chapter 10, and uh, go down to verse 18. Luke chapter 10, verses 18 through 20. And this is Jesus speaking. He said, yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them, and nothing will injure you. 
But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. And run a highlighter through the words of Jesus when he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now, Jesus was referencing the uh, words of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. In fact, I'll take the time to go there with you uh, if you'd like. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Jesus was actually quoting uh, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. How are you fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning? You have been thrown down to earth. Now, this obviously is speaking of Lucifer, who sometimes we commonly call Satan. Lucifer was his name in heaven. Satan is often his name here on earth. But Lucifer was an angel created by God, and he was a very magnificent angel. He was above angels. He was originally an archangel, and he had special giftings, especially in music and in worship, and not in instruments that he played, but it came out of him. He was a very special angel. Not only an archangel, he was uh, a beautiful angel, and it was his beauty and his giftings and his talent and his pride that caused him to be exalted and to feel that he could rise above God. And Isaiah the prophet is speaking about when he led his revolt with one-third of the angels in heaven, he was instantaneously cast out of heaven by God who has all power. And that's what the prophet Isaiah is saying. How are you fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning? You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the Most High. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Now, if I had time, I could take you a little deeper in the study, but for the sake of time, let me just point it out. In the words of Isaiah, we see what caused the fall and the casting out of Lucifer from his original created place, cast down to earth. And if you walk through that passage I read, you will find five times, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And that is where evil has its infancy seed. The gestation of evil always begins with I will or my will. That's why we see the antithesis of that in Christ. In his prayer, he prayed, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. That's why there was no sin or evil or wickedness in Christ. He had already settled the Father's will. There was never an I will out of Christ when he was on this earth in human form carrying out his ministry as prophet, priest, and king. He was all about the Father's will. But Satan, Lucifer... His demise was in the foundation of getting his focus off of God's will and beginning to put the emphasis upon I will. Five times in that passage. And that's a study in and of itself. But I only highlight it for you to see that the conception and the gestation stages of all sin and wickedness and perverseness and evil is contingent upon somebody who is out of relationship with the will of God 
They have rejected God. They no longer hunger for the holiness of God. And life has way too much eye in it. The Bible said in John chapter 3 and verse 30, Christ must increase and I must decrease. One very famous missionary to the Muslim nations was famous for a saying. He quoted, preach Christ, die, be forgotten. That was his motto. Preach Christ, die, and be forgotten. That would be the extreme of John 3.30. He must increase, I must decrease. But I want to lay that down as a foundation as we go through this teaching. Evil may not be in your life in abundance now, but if you allow your life to get so self-centered and everything is about you and your desires and your aspirations and your wants and your needs and I, 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 just remember who your father is that causes you to say such things and to desire such things. But Jesus in Luke was quoting the prophet Isaiah. But Jesus said, I saw Satan like lightning fall. Now, the reason I point this out to you is it's very weighty. As a matter of fact, it's a major doctrinal passage. Why is it a major doctrinal passage? Because Jesus reveals two absolute truths when he made that statement. Number one, he reveals that he is a part of the Godhead because he pre-existed before the creation of Lucifer or Satan. I saw. He was there. He was there before Satan. He was there when he was cast out of heaven. And the second thing that Jesus reveals in those comments, and of course Isaiah is, is not speaking of himself. He's a prophetic voice. Jesus reveals that God has all authority over Lucifer then and Satan now. He was cast out of heaven. And so we learn, and it would be a gold nugget to write down, the creation is always lesser than the creator. God was the creator. Lucifer, even though he was a mighty, powerful archangel with talents and beauty like no other angel that God had created, he did not have power and authority over God. So that brings us to what I would call the fundamental definition of evil. And here's where you need to put all of your IQ points together and pay attention. Because if there's one thing I really want you to learn out of our study today, is I want you to learn what evil is. Because sadly, I've heard many people that have tenure in ministry and and the degrees behind their name in preaching and teaching and lecturing on sin and wickedness and evil uh, violate this. And their definitions are askew uh, from the scripture. So let me give to you a fundamental definition of evil. Are you ready? Evil is the absence of righteousness. Evil is the absence of righteousness. Evil is the absence of holiness. Evil is the absence of righteousness. Evil is the darkness that exists because of the absence of the light. Let me give that to you again. Evil is the absence of righteousness Evil is the absence of holiness. Evil is the absence of God. Evil is the darkness that exists because of the absence of light. Now, why is that so vitally important? Because it answers a question that is often misstated and mistaught, and that is God did not create evil. There are many Bible teachers that and I don't know why, and I'm certainly not trying to be judgmental, but they, they, they give God the authorship. 
And they say, nothing exists that God did not create, including evil. I actually heard one very famous minister recently, and I'll not mention their name, say God created evil so that he could destroy evil. I don't follow that line of theological reasoning, but he went on to say God created evil so he could destroy evil. God created evil so that he could create sinners so that he could forgive sinners and restore them to himself. He went on to say God created evil because God uses evil to show the display of his wrath to keep people in righteous fear. And he had all of these, and, and by his own confession, he said, uh, I have learned this through my years of studying the Bible, and though I cannot pinpoint and give you a verse for each one of these, it is a collective understanding of the narrative of evil found in the Bible. Well, I could not disagree more, and the Bible backs what I'm teaching you. God, don't miss this, God did not create evil. Evil is the rejection and the absence of God. Just as darkness exists when you remove the light, so evil exists when you remove God. God is the centerpiece of all, the creator of all. And to try to remove God out of the equation of all results in the darkness of wickedness and evil. God cannot create evil because God is perfect. The Bible is clear on that. Be perfect because I, the Lord thy God, am perfect. And in him there is no sin, there is no guile, there is no wickedness, there is no evil. God did not create evil. He creates, the Bible says, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, sustains all things. But when you remove God from anything, including your own life, then the door is open for evil. Because as soon as you make a decision, a willful decision to shut out the light of God, evil is the absence of God. Evil is the absence of His righteousness. Evil is the absence of His holiness. The darkness of evil is the direct result of the absence of the light of God. Question number two, why does God allow evil? If God is ultimate in power, if God has authority over all, why does God allow evil? Well, if you'll go back to our text in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis uh, chapter 1, and go down to verse 31 and run a highlighter through that as I asked you before. Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. All God created, very good. All God created, very good. Uh, I don't particularly uh, like it. I probably have heard it so many times in so many churches, it's just starting to grate on me a little bit because of how casual it is. But there is truth in it. And uh, maybe if you're a believer, you've heard it in your church. And again, no judgment, but you probably have heard people chant in churches, uh, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. Well, it's a truth, but I, I detest when people say things in comedy or lightness that carry the weight of the holiness and the goodness and the purity of God. There should be reverence in that. It should be more than just a cliche uh, to fill in between uh, the first worship song and the second worship song. He is good, and He is good all the time. And I want you to see Genesis 1.31, where the Bible said everything He created was very good. So when people say that God created evil, they violate Genesis 1.31. No, it said everything He made was very good. And everything in the Hebrew means everything God created was very good. 
So all evil in the world comes from two entities. Are you ready for this? Uh, have that notebook or that iPad or that digital device ready because this is getting into the very uh, crux of answering the question. And when people ask of you, you should have the ability to answer. And so question number two, why does God allow evil? Write this down. All evil comes from two entities. All evil comes from two entities. Number one, Satan. All evil is con connected to two entities, and the first is Satan. Now, secular history, entertainment, cartoons, etc., always tries to downplay the character of what we see in the Scripture. Satan does not dance around as some cute little imp in a red outfit with a tail and a, and a pitchfork. And even in, in modern music today, not long ago, it was all over the news worldwide of some award show, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know who the singer is, and I don't care. But flaunting himself as Satan and all of the people dancing dressed like demons, and the song was evil, and the presentation was evil. It is no longer hidden. We actually live in a world that rejoices in evil, and it was prophesied, and most of you know that uh, one of my absolute loves of Scripture is the study of eschatology and Bible prophecy and end-time events. Well, the Bible prophesied that as a warning that you're living in the last days. How do you know it? that you're living in the last days and close to the soon return of Christ. The Bible said the world culture would begin to call evil good and good evil. Nothing could be further from the truth. Satan is not a cute imp in red with a pitchfork and a tail. The Bible teaches us that he is the eminent demonic being who is the chief of all fallen angels and the ruler of this fallen world. Did you know that? The Bible teaches us he was cast out of heaven to this earth, but he is the chief eminent angel who has been given by God power over all this earth. Uh, going to uh, the Gospel of John, and I believe it's in the 12th chapter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 12, and go down to verse 31. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, I want to highlight her through that, Satan, the ruler of this world will be cast out. And so God has allowed him to be the ruler of this world, don't miss this, for a limited time and with limited authority. Biblically, here it is pure and simple, biblically we see that he is the ruler of this world but we must not ascribe to his rulership sovereignty and power equal to God. Remember, the creation is subservient to the creator. The creation is lesser than the creator. And so, yes, the Bible is, I've read it to you, the ruler, Satan, the ruler of this world here on earth. But that power is for a limited time. It has an expiration date. And secondly, it has limits in authority. God has not given, and again, I've heard poor teaching on this that sometimes surprises me. They'll read that verse about him being the ruler of the world, and they'll give him unlimited power. He does not have unlimited power, even though he is the ruler of this world, Limited time, limited power. Only God has total omnipotence and sovereignty. Write that down. Only God has total omnipotence and total authority. But he has allowed Satan 
as a fallen angel, limited power over a fallen world. A fallen angel with limited power over a fallen world. A fallen angel with limited power over a fallen world. I said that there are two entities when it comes to all evil. All evil connected to two things. Number one, Satan. Number two, human nature. Us. Mankind, men, women, created in the image of God, but outside of God, out of right relationship with God. That's where evil has a source. The Bible tells us that evil comes from within the hearts and the minds of men. Uh, let's take time to go into uh, the book of Jeremiah and the 17th chapter. And if you don't have this one highlighted in your Bible, be sure this is one of those passages that is quite revealing and quite humbling. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, the Bible said, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. But notice what the prophet Jeremiah said. He said the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked or evil. And so all evil is connected, number one, to Satan, and when you're not in right relationship with God, your father is Satan, the scripture teaches us. And so the influence of demonic wickedness and demonic evil is in the heart of all outside of Christ. All unbelievers are under the authority and influence of Satan and his curse. You heard me right. All unbelievers, if you're not right with God, if you've never repented of sin and recognized your need of a Savior, if you've never invited Christ to come into your heart to forgive you with the blood that He shed on the cross, cleanse your mind, your body, and spirit, if you've never been born again and you're an unbeliever, then the Bible teaches me that all unbelievers, without exception, all unbelievers are under the influence and the authority of Satan and the curse of sin. If God is not your father and Jesus is not your savior, your God is Satan. He has power over you. He has authority over you. He has influence over you. Now, I'm not going to leave you hanging with that piece of horror to haunt your dreams I'm going to pray with you at the end of this Bible study. There's probably going to be thousands of people that will end up watching this study. And if you'll be honest with yourself and honest with God, you're not living for God. You're not living in victory over sin. Sin is living in victory over you. You're not living to decrease and Christ to increase. Your world's about you. Your want, your dream, your aspiration, your money, your promotion, your possessions, etc., your pleasures. You're outside of God, and I'm not judging you. I just might be the first person in your life to look you in the eyes and tell you God loves you, but He hates your sin. And if you do not have God as your Father, well, guess what the option is? Either God is your Father, or Satan, the power of this world is your father, and you're under the curse of sin and demonic influence. The Apostle Paul, who wrote almost one-third of the New Testament, wrote to a bunch of new believing Christians in a city called Ephesus, which is the book of Ephesians in the Bible, and he reminded them that before they repented of sin, before they had accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, that Satan was in command of their lives, and his demonic spirits Demonic spirits influenced their hearts to rebel against God and righteousness. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 2. 
As you've probably heard about me by now, I'm one of those old-fashioned teachers, Bible preachers that starts in the Bible, stays in the Bible, and finishes in the Bible. Ephesians 2, verse 2, You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. Again, this is the Apostle Paul. He's in a city called Ephesus. There's a brand new church, new believers. He's writing this book to the Ephesians, and he reminded them of what their life was like before they repented of sin and received Christ. He said, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And so if you're not living in obedience to God, in obedience to His Word, in obedience to the teachings of Christ, the Bible said your father is Satan. He has power over your life, your family, your children, your money, your health. Everything you have is under the power of sin and Satan and his curse. And the Bible says he has power to influence your heart for behaviors that you perhaps in a sensible mind would not choose to do. That's why people do stupid things. I had a message I used to preach years ago when I first started in ministry. I'll never forget the title of it, and it probably was not very impressive to the academic world, but the title of that message was, Sin Will Make You Stupid. And it does. Sin makes people stupid. How many times have you heard on the news or heard somebody say, why would a human being ever even think about doing something like that? What were they thinking? I'll tell you what they were thinking. Sin will make you stupid. And the Bible said, Paul said, Jesus said, the scriptures agree that if you're not right with God, your father, your father is Satan. He has authority over you. You're living under his curse. You're living under his influence, and he has you like a puppet on strings, doing things, making decisions, behaviors that if you had thought through, you wouldn't do it. But you don't even have the ability to think properly because he has power and influence over your thought process. We'll come back to that. Just as all unbelievers, listen carefully, just as all unbelievers are under the power of Satan, the power of sin, the curse of sin, and wickedness and evil potentially lies within. All believers are under the authority and influence of God and His blessing. Now, I don't know about you. If I have to make a choice between living my life on this earth, my family, my children, my grandchildren, if I have a choice, because when you make a choice, it affects your family. The Bible said this blessing will not only be upon you, it'll be upon your descendants. Your decision for Christ will not only affect your life, it'll affect people around you and your loved ones and your family and your children and your grandchildren, and you should be praying for them. But every believer is under the authority and the influence of God the Father and His blessing. And so you have to make a choice. Are you going to live under the curse of evil and sin and wickedness with your father being Satan who influences you and puppets you throughout your life? Or are you going to choose God to be your father and live with His forgiveness, His righteousness, His peace, His blessing, His supernatural power, His healing, on and on. Well, sometimes I tell people I need to pray about that. And I say, in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, let's do it. Some things you don't need a one-hour Bible study to figure out. You just know it to be right. Colossians chapter 1. Let's go there. Galatians, Ephesians, right there to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, the Bible said, For he, speaking of Christ, for Jesus Christ has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his 
dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. God the Father gave us Jesus and rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. His dear Son is Jesus, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. So don't miss this summation statement. All evil comes from two places, Satan and from humanity. Satan is responsible for the evil in the world, but so are we. Let me show you another powerful passage, Matthew, Mark. Mark chapter 7, go down to verse 20. Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23. And he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart. Remember what Jeremiah said? He said, the heart of human beings is wicked above all things. Your heart outside of God is wicked. And the scripture said, from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within, and they are what defile you. One last question, and then we'll pray. Why doesn't God stop evil? Why doesn't God, if He's all-powerful, if He's omnipotent, why doesn't He stop evil? Well, in our text in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, the Bible said, God said, let us make man in our own image to be like us. So all human beings, men and women, He created them male and female, that's it, are made in His image. And the Bible tells us that he's a triune Godhead. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he created us with triune imagery. And it's a doctrinal uh, phrase, uh, you don't have to remember it. But just know that in God's image, in the triune nature of God, you were created with triune attrib attributes. And what are they? Number one, he gave to us intelligence. Because you were created in the image of God, the closer you get to God, the more intelligent you become. The further you waver from God, stray from God, the less intelligent you become. That's why we have world leaders with some of the finest education that money can buy who don't have the ability to understand common sense things that grandmothers who only went to the third grade could tell them gone to Ivy League schools. They've rubbed shoulders with thinkers all over the world. They, they rise to prominence and they, they rule and run nations. They don't have an ability to balance a checkbook. They don't have the ability to know what's right and what's wrong. We live in a country now where they're penalizing people who have good credit and people who pay their bills on time and have good credit They've decided that it's going to be intelligent to make them have higher interest rates and give better interest rates to losers who don't manage their money, don't work, don't pay their bills. Let's reward incompetence and let's penalize capitalism. You know who made those decisions? People that went to Ivy League schools sitting around circles and cabinet meetings, making intelligent decisions. They're not intelligent decisions. They're unlettered. They're ignorant. Why? Because it doesn't matter where you go to school. If you wander away from God, your path is always down. Your IQ is always down. Your decision-making abilities are always trending down. But I have good news. Once you turn from sin and turn to Christ, I don't care if you never finished high school. The day you get right with God, your path will be forward and upward. James in the Bible said, If anybody lacks wisdom, let them ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. You get smarter the closer you get to God. 
You make stupid decisions when you walk away. He gave us intelligence. Well, what is intelligence? It's, in essence, the ability to understand things. Analysis, synthesis, processing. Intelligence is the ability to understand things. Now, I said triune. There's two more. Number two, he gave us the ability to reason. He gave us intelligence, but he didn't give us intelligence without reason. And reason is the ability to process intelligence and to understand what that results like in proper behaviors. And third, he gave us choice. And choice is the free will to decide our behaviors. God created you in his image, and inside you are seeds of greatness in intelligence and in reason and in free moral choice. Now, when those triune attributes are in right relationship with God, you'll thrive. That's one of the great things to see when in our Lost Lamb events, people turn from sin and receive Christ. I told the testimony just last weekend as I was ministering of a man in Upper State, New York. Sin had taken everything from him. But he ended up living in the woods like a wild animal. He had a successful business. He had a family. He had children. He had all of the toys. He had everything. He had the American dream. But somehow at a party, he got connected and involved with drugs. His life began to spiral, and he lost it all. He lost his business, lost his home, lost his wife, lost his children. They couldn't trust him. They lived. They moved away. And he just continued to spiral downward until he was living like a Bigfoot out in the woods in the wilderness, living literally, by his own words, like an animal. Somebody brought him to one of our Lost Lamb events, and that night he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And in less than two years from the moment he gave his heart to Christ, God restored his life, God restored his mind, God restored his health. His wife came back, his children came back, God gave him an idea for a business. Within two years, he was a millionaire. The church that he was at built a new Sunday school wing. He personally paid for it. His wife's on the worship team. Their family's thriving. What happened? Evil got a hold of him, and everything sin, wickedness, and evil touches. The Bible said the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But when you come to Christ, he said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So whether we discuss the doctrine of angels or men, they both have intelligence, they both have reason, and they both have free moral choice. It's not that God does not have all power, but if you force somebody into relationship, it's no longer a relationship. The very essence of relationship requires mutual respect and mutual love. If God made you like a robot to love him, to live for him, that's not relationship. It's not intelligence. It's not reason. It's not free moral choice. You're just robotic, and God didn't create you like that. He created you in His image. He loves you enough to let you decide whether you want to be in relationship with Him or not. But if you're not in relationship with God, you're in relationship with Satan. And if you're in relationship with Satan, you're in relationship with evil. And it may not show up now, but if you ever wonder why evil things happen in the world, all evil is the absence of God the absence of holiness, the absence of righteousness, the absence of light. When you reject light, the only alternative is darkness. When you reject God, the only alternative is evil. Free will allows men to choose evil over good, but suffering is always the result. So as we close, please don't miss this. One of the things I emphasized in this study I hope that it will be branded deep in your mind and in your spirit and in your heart. God did not create evil. Evil simply exists where God has been rejected. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, the Bible says concerning God, but you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. God is pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. 
But the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 21 that Satan's power is limited and Satan's time is limited. Let's go there and then we'll pray. Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and the 21st chapter. Go down to verses 5 through 8. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end to all who are thirsty. I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all of these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children." But cowards and unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, and this is the second death. The Bible tells us in Bible prophecy and other passages as well that God has prepared a day when He's going to make all things new. The Bible said he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth where everyone is right with God. Evil is counting down its final days. And God will soon purge the world of all unrighteousness. And the Bible says he will return for those who have chosen him. Have you chosen him? There's only two choices. You can receive God or you can reject God. To receive God is to receive righteousness and blessing and health and hope and God's bright promises for tomorrow. But to reject God is to allow Satan to be your father and to allow evil and wickedness to dominate and influence your life. Will you pray with me today? Some of you perhaps have never had anyone love you enough to look you in the eyes and tell you God loves you and he'll forgive you. And he'll forgive and break all of the curse of sin, but you've got to receive him by free choice. By intelligence, you've heard the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Reason, God gave you the ability to reason and understand the precepts that I've given you today. But now in free moral choice, what will you do with Christ? If you want to receive him, maybe you've wandered away and you need to come back home. Pray with me. And when we're done praying, I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org. It's people like you that I've dedicated my life to. And this isn't the end of what God's going to do. It's just the beginning. And I want you to go to our website, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings and begin your journey of faith with those teachings I have prepared specifically just for you. Pray with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I recognize my sin and I repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Christ. I trust in your love. I trust in the cross and the blood that was shed. I trust in your Son who's risen, who promised to come again. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Today I choose salvation. I choose forgiveness. I choose eternal life. I choose blessing and healing. From this day forward, I vow to live for you. Strengthen me to be what you want me to be. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.